Death and Fruit, I guess, would be to kind of reclaim that access to doing it ourselves because we can, because we can, and it's our right, but also just because it's so meaningful to be able to be um, involved. And I think people have kind of forgotten um, uh, the benefits of doing it ourselves. So just to be clear, death midwife isn't a profession. Like there is no regulating body. Like you can say I'm a nurse and that means something because it means you have to take a test. It means you belong to a college that gives you a certification and you are a registered nurse. There's no such thing. So if someone says they're a death midwife, that can be anything. Mm -hmm. And um, what I prefer instead to, and other people use different terms. They'd say I'm a home funeral guide. They'd say I'm an end of life guide. They, like there's lots of um, terms that people like to use or death doula. People oh, use that term. Okay. Um, and the fact is none of those are regulated and um, a lot of the people that are doing that kind of work have other certifications that they are RNs or maybe they're social workers or maybe they're um, uh, ministers or and ordained in different churches so there's you know lots of different uh, credentialing that people bring to that but there is no standard death midwife profession or certification or college of death midwives. It was probably in the early 80s that um, there started to be sort of a, a, a movement of, of uh, home funeral guides, people who were saying, hey, we can do this ourselves, and started to kind of, like the early birth midwifery movement, started doing that. Some of those um, pioneers in the home funeral um, movement experienced a death themselves. So one of them, for example, Beth Knox, um, had her, uh, I think, eight-year-old daughter die in an uh, early, one of those early airbag incidents where was like low speed and before they knew the kids shouldn't be in the front seat and the airbag killed her. And she was told that she couldn't take her daughter, her dead daughter, home from the hospital. And it just seemed just completely counterintuitive. Like I cared for this girl every day of her life, every moment. And why would I suddenly hand her over, especially when we're all traumatized and we need to just be with her and soak in this reality and she's died. So anyway, Beth Knox really pushed up against a system that would have told her that she couldn't do it and said, hey, why can't I? And it was indeed her legal right to do it and she pushed and pushed until she brought her daughter home and then really got involved in, in um, with others who were starting a movement and uh, saying, hey, we can and should and there are real benefits to doing this ourselves. Why now? Like, Why do you think like perceptions are changing? What do you think like the dominant perception of death in Canada is? All of our protracted, complicated grieving and our disconnection with death and our fear of aging and our, you know, attempt to um, pretend that we're never going to die and, and that culturally is maybe tied into the fact that we just are out of touch and have no contact with, with death and what it looks like and what it means we're terrified of it. And the fact is it's all about people doing it themselves. And in that sense, I would say it's a bit different than the birth in life. With birth, um, there is arguably a real clinical aspect to that in the sense that you need a, a certain skill to know what it looks like when a baby comes out sunny side up or is getting stuck or and that you have some skills to save a life, frankly, because um, knowing what to look for and how to help that guide that baby out can really make a difference between the mother and the baby living or dying. Death is quite different in the sense that this person is dead and you can't fuck it up. <laughs> so so I, I think that makes it all the, um, it, that makes it different. And that the, um, the skill set and training that support people are bringing to that is really individual. And what does a family need? Do they need help to talk through their problems before their loved one dies? Like, do they need real help to communicate and work through old grievances and, um, you know, come to terms as family? Or maybe they don't need that and what they need is maybe someone is just spiritually terrified of dying and they need someone to come in in a more pastoral or spiritual care way and say, hey, let's you know, really talk and, and, and maybe rituals around getting ready for that transition. Or maybe they just need logistical help. Maybe they need, need someone that's more like a party planner to help them. How are we gonna make this work with you know having people around in our home for a vigil? How are we gonna feed all these people? How are, maybe they need more of that. 
Um, maybe they're really scared about um, the idea of a body and how you touch it and you know keep it cool and, and maybe they just need some education. So depending on what the family needs, there are different people with different skill sets okay. and any of those might be called a definite way. So how, how do we get back in touch with that? Like do you think this whole funeral movement, that's what the, the end goal of it is to just like For sure. people to have a more realistic expectation yeah. of what it's like to die and what a yeah. body looks like. Yeah, I think you only have to deal with it once. I think like, um, and, and you'll hear about people in the home funeral movement, they'll say, um, they, they got invited to a home funeral and after they saw it happen once, they're like, of course we can do this. I, I think you just need one experience with it um, to know, or, or even just to hear about it, even if you don't have the opportunity to be with someone uh, after death firsthand. Like even just to hear, really, it's legal, really, it's safe. And then people are like, well then, but it's just no one talks about it and people haven't heard. And as soon as they hear, most people are, are uh, on board. Uh, I think we just need to talk about it more, <laughs> like start start early. Um, uh, for example, people will often not bring children to, to funerals or not talk about the, the illness or death of a grandparent with kids, and I would say um, now we need to start talking about it. Um, so talking about it with our kids and having that be something that they're exposed to um, from an early age. But then um, having the courage for you at your age, like you don't anticipate dying anytime soon, you can talk with your parents or whoever is your next of kin. Um, or your partner about about what you want and what you uh, value, and you know, like to make those plans early and now. And that's to start thinking about that is not morbid, that it doesn't mean you want to die or that you will die, but but just to start that conversation.